Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Navani. I'm the host of the Total Bitcoin Show, and uh, it's all about Bitcoin and Austrian economics. And today, my very special guest is Matthew Masinskis, the host of Crypto Voices. Matthew, thanks so much for coming again to my show. How are Hi. you doing? Good. Very good. Thanks a lot for having me. All right. I'm I know it's more in the shade than I... Uh, yeah, exactly. Started. Yeah. <laughs> Very mysterious. Yeah, the winters are coming pretty extreme, probably more in Austria <laughs> than in Riga. <laughs> yeah, I was actually just in the U.S. and it was uh, minus nine Celsius as I flew out of uh, Seriously? Chicago. Yeah, and then got back to Riga and it was raining and like plus 11, so... Jesus, bit. yeah. I mean, if it were up to me, I would just, I would just be not here in Austria seasonally for like half a year or whatever, yeah. you know. So, um, yeah. So the last time I saw you, um, you, you, you did, you didn't go to the Berlin uh, Lightning Conference. Did I didn't make it. No, I heard. Yeah, it I didn't make it. Yeah, yeah. You I saw that? you on in Riga, right? That was the last time we saw. Yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. It was a great Palette. conference. Yeah, yeah, those guys do a great job, uh, really professional and, you know, they've really tried to be focused over the years and it was great. Uh, it's great to meet them, obviously, being in the same geographic area. Um, so it, uh, they really do a good job every year. Mm -hmm. You know, you, uh, Matthew, and uh, uh, Eric Vaskuvel, you, you are the, I think, the only ones who really make articulate distinction when it comes to money and credit. It's like, you know, the, the very strict teacher is like, no, this is money. And uh, if, if you don't like, this is what I, what I got all, uh, you know, out of your podcast, like you're going through like step by step uh, to your, uh, through your Twitter thread. Let me just show this for the YouTube uh, viewers um, over here. Cause I, I listened to, to that podcast you did and you went like step by step. And the thing I got out of it, uh, cause I want to, you know, also break it down for my listeners and our viewers is uh, when you have a claim on something, it's not money. It could, is that like the substrate of this? Uh, actually, I, I wouldn't uh, completely say that. It's, it's, it is confusing to make these breaks and distinctions when you talked about trying to systematize money and stuff. Claims can be money. I would say claims can be money. It's just claims aren't base money. And that's the distinction we like to make for a variety of reasons because um, basic money or base money is a money supply that has been sort of systematized and observed and categorized by economists for many, many years. Um, and then these sort of claims, as, as you mentioned, which are accounts like checking accounts, savings accounts, uh, time deposit accounts at banks or financial institutions, those have been systematized more recently, although certainly like hundreds of years ago, we had this data. Um, but certainly like in the last century, uh, Federal Reserve actually did this a lot. Paul Volcker and them in like the 50s and 60s, um, they really started to develop uh, this sort of a framework of this claim money or what they call narrow and broad money or what they also call M1, M2, M3. We can discuss all those if you want. But... Um, the, the, the distinction that we like to make is just that all of those money supplies, um, M1, M2, M3 accounts, you know, when you log into your financial institution, your bank, you see your name and your dashboard and see, you know, numbers on the screen, euros, dollars, whatever. At the end of the day, those are claims. Those accounts are claims. There is, there, there is, um, th there are guarantees from the government, you know, up to certain dollar amounts or euro amounts. Um, there's, you know, what, what they call FDI, FDIC insurance in the U S or some, uh, depository insurance in, in Europe. Um, so that they, they kind of, we have, feel like there, there's some more security there, at least from the government, but at the end of the day, it's still a claim on that financial institution. So, uh, when you deposit basic money and maybe now is the time to, to make the distinction between basic money. So if, if those accounts are claims base money or basic money, that is something that's not a claim. It's something that's not a claim. So it's an important distinction. And, you know, in years of yore, you know, and gold, silver, silver was base money well before gold, then gold sort of officially became base money uh, worldwide 
during the British Empire, although it had circulated as base money in the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. Uh, gold was certainly basic money because that was something that was not a plain claim. If you held the gold coin, it was yours. It was nobody else's liability. It was your asset, nobody else's liability. It was your asset, also your equity, but it was your asset. So that was something that you could use to pay debts if you needed or to pay for things, uh, so on and so forth. But the, the, the really important distinction that's not made a lot and not really made a lot in Austrian economics um, is that it's uh, basic money is, is a claim is uh, sorry. Basic money is, is sort of ultimate settlement. It's final settlement. There is no further claim when it comes to base money. So gold and silver sort of obviously served as that in the past. And then once central banking really sort of uh, developed and took off for the last couple hundred years, you know, with uh, the bank of Sweden, the bank of England, and then uh, the federal reserve, uh, in the U.S., those uh, those their their notes that their monopolized notes of issue, which they could issue, um, at the very beginning actually were claims as well. They uh, they started out kind of as private banks, the Fed not as much, but Bank of England, Bank of Sweden, yes, they were issuing notes. They were sort of uh, even bailing out and doing some of these things, but not in the same way that we hear today, like lender of last resort. But just as the years go by, we start to develop some comfort. The state gets involved. Um, what has happened with those issues, their monopoly issues, different, different than market issues of money, such as gold and silver, market mining of money. Uh, those, uh, those institutions, those central banks, eventually became to have, have known as their own basic money as well. So dollars, euros, yen, literally the physical things that you see in your, in your wallet, holding your wallet. And then also the uh, money that they literally as a ledger entry or as a digital printing press, what they put in their banking institutions accounts, that's called the reserve account. Those two things together comprise the monetary base. And those things, uh, so, that, so I started to talk about this process. It was gold and silver. And then eventually over the years, after World War I, gold standard really ended. And then really after World War II, there was like no chance of, uh, any competing bank holding it because Hitler uh, basically made all of the gold leave Europe and enter the U.S. Um, the U.S. was pretty centralized there, holding the gold. And so uh, central banks could claim on the U.S. their gold if they needed. France started to do that in the 60s, famously. And then since 1971, uh, we've been, so literally only 50 years. You know, we've been hundreds of years, thousands of years with gold and silver as money, but literally only 50 years have we been in this sort of fiat world where fiat central money, the fiat monetary base um, as well represents something that's not a claim. And I don't say that in necessarily a good way, or I categorize that with gold. A lot of people think that like I categorize fiat and, you know, Fernando and I both talk about this. We, when we talk about fiat as base money, like we're sort of unfairly putting into this category with gold and silver. That's not the intent. It's just to show <laughs> that they are monopoly issuers. They have full control. They can do whatever they want. And so it's, it's uh, at the end of the day, there is, not, there is nothing behind the financial system other than their note of issue that could settle a debt. Not even gold and silver anymore. They have sort of strong-armed that out of the picture. So those, uh, those monopoly issuers, those central banks, uh, around the world today, they issue base money as well. So it's a long-winded, long-winded way of saying just to just to make it clear: um, two different types of money. But uh, the the really important distinction is that all of the money that you see in a bank, in a banking institution, in your depository institution, in your credit union, if you see it on the statement, your financial statement that is a claim on that institution. It's not, it's not basic money. It's not something that doesn't have another liability. You know, you can't hold it in your hand. And so, so there, there comes the, the comparison with Bitcoin. That's, that's what we've tried to, to make clear is that's exactly what happens with Bitcoin's 21, you know, eventual 21 million units. Um, when you remove Bitcoin from an exchange, you're holding basic money. There's no other claim. No other counterparty, no other check, Visa, PayPal, Venmo. There's only Bitcoin that sits mm -hmm. there. 
and that's mm-hmm. basically that's basic money. So, so it is, it is, uh, I'll, I'll stop talking here, but, but it is hard because we, we don't, we don't make the, we don't say that claims aren't money. Claims can be money. Um, and circulate is money. We talk about, you know, our check account is money. Um, you know, how much money we have in our account or whatever come payday. We talk about it all the time as money. It, it does circulate at money as money. It's just not base money. So that's mm-hmm. the, that's the distinction we make. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you before I forget that detail. I mean, uh, I mean it's self-explanatory, but uh, when you have something in your deposit account and you know you have this, what do you call it? In, in, in US, it's called a federal deposit FDIC, insurance. Yeah, federal yeah. deposit. Uh, yeah, something different maybe in Austria. So it's you know, up to whatever, 100,000 euro or something. So it's still, it's still a claim because you would still, if they really screw up or uh, you would still have to sue or whatever, or go judicially after them. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And we say that uh, in every situation, you know, like if, if a bank goes under, which is rare because they're very safeguarded and, and, and whatnot. But if a bank goes under, what, what do you become as a depositor? You become a creditor. You're a creditor of the bank. You're, you're always a creditor, but, but you're officially sort of known now in legalese as the creditor. You're waiting on the bank to sell off all of their assets and then you're in line as with all the other creditors uh, to get your money and, and how that line forms is sometimes controversial. Um, but that's just how it works. That's how the system has, has scaled. And like it was with, with uh, empty Gox, uh, Mount Gox, empty Gox is Andreas Antonopoulos says, I always <laughs> that. I like that as well. <laughs> empty Gox, uh, you know, you, if you had Bitcoin there uh, and now the Bitcoin is not there, but there is, there is some that's, you know, with, uh, in Japan and they're working through the legal system still, I think next year they're going to make another ruling on it. Maybe the final ruling. I can't remember, Mm -hmm. but after, you know, literally after what, five years of that, what are you, if you had Bitcoin and empty Gox, you, you're now a creditor, you're creditor of empty Gox and the legal system. It's just how it works. It's how it works. There's, there's no money there. At least there's not money the way you thought it was. You're going after assets. You're going to try to sell in the marketplace. Primarily that asset is Bitcoin. It's controlled by, this administrator, um, but uh, you know, and there's a lot of legal things to sort through. Yeah. But normal course of business, you know, when business is working and and people are just trying to satisfy supply and demand of money, bank what banks do, you know, and, and also lending money, um, that that relationship is simply one of of debtor and creditor, and that's a hard thing. I think for a lot, that's a hard pill for a lot of Austrians to swallow that have read a lot of uh, Rothbard primarily. Rothbard was the, the main man that, that really made the, the, the claim. He, he posited that uh, fractional reserve banking was fraudulent. Um, and I don't know if I want to go into that yet. We can No, go- no, it's important because there's a couple of, uh, which I read a book, for example, of DeSoto. Um, money credit and I don't know what it is called economic uh, something like that right. um, the credit cycle or something. exactly he, he doesn't, it, doesn't it doesn't it like like they represent the same position like Rothbard uh, yeah, uh, the, it does. It does. it's actually criminal I mean it's actually it's it's theft it's whatever it's it's uh, embezzlement or right he goes even into the legal right. aspects of what do you think about it right I mean yeah, yeah. So Fernando, uh, my co-host, he, um, his teacher was De Soto. He's oh, Canada, really? <laughs> Austrian economic from Madrid. Yep, under De Soto, and and I've met him. Uh, that's actually where Fernando, Fernando and I met. It was at an Austrian event like ten years ago now in Spain, uh, not in Madrid, but in Salamanca, and um, sort of they, they were building it at the time as the birthplace of economics, which uh, which was really interesting events. A lot of a lot of European Austrians met at the time there. Because that was like pre, not to get too many tangents, but that was like kind of pre Twitter and pre a lot of uh, sort of social media things for a lot of. So when we came together at that event, uh, it was like, oh, there's a lot of other people reading these crazy economic textbooks as me. It's pretty interesting. So that was that was a great event. But um, in any event, I think Soto is a wonderful uh, economist and a wonderful uh, uh, sort of teacher. Uh, of, of, of economic thought, I think, um, as far as I can tell from Fernando, who obviously knows him better than me, is like he has great relationship with all of his students. Many of him disagree with him, by the way, on this really? point. Uh-huh. Um, Juan, Juan Rayo would probably be the f- most famous one. He's, uh, he, uh, 
tends to represent this maturity mismatch school. Uh, Fernando kind of likes that as well. It's basically just saying, you know, if you have a, um, if you have 30 year uh, paper, like if you have a 30 year sort of loan, uh, then you need to just make sure you're matching that with 30 year sort of deposits. That's, that's a, that's a very like extreme example, like say, say five years. So, um, you know, you have, you have a five year, uh, time deposit, then you can match that with a five year loan. Um, and there's a lot of, I think, benefits to that. I'm not necessarily in any school that wants to like delineate, uh, specifically on how a bank should be run because I just, I'm a fan of the market. And I think it's, I'm a big fan of caveat emptor, you know, like let the buyer beware if yeah. you, if you, you, you need to, we really should understand that, you know, it comes down to the terms and we're seeing this all the time in all random areas today, right? Like people aren't reading Twitter terms and then people are getting banned, but it's Twitter's decision to do that. And I don't like some of the times where that happens, but it happens. And there's a lot of social pressure that pushes back because people don't think those terms are just the right. So there's a lot of, there's always push and pull with these things. There's no, there's no like hard and fast line, but one of the things, just to, just to make it clear that uh, when you say a lot of these things, like we say that money is a claim in, in deposit institutions, people might think about a lot of the stuff that Rothbard wrote or that DeSoto wrote. Um, those, uh, just, this is just generally speaking, I can't like pick a, a general uh, point here, but those points about banks being fraudulent, as far as I can tell, and, and I've heard a lot of Austrians today. So this is like Rothbard was starting, you know, these ideas in the 60s, 70s, you know, 80s, when he was really writing hardcore on banks being fraudulent. Um, and then Dr. Selzin and Dr. White, who we've both had on our podcast, they're fans of this free banking school. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other side, they started to argue more with, with him and Hans Hoppe in like the 90s. But anyway, just to show like there's been a lot of argument about this over the years. Uh... The main point I wanted to say about the fraudulent aspect, though, is that most Austrians don't make that anymore. Uh, very interesting. They used to. Uh, they used to, I think, follow Rothbard's lead a lot. Uh, De Soto, I, I don't know enough about his recent writings. Like, I know in that book he makes the argument. But I don't know in his recent writings if he's really uh, gung-ho about that anymore. But uh, I, I've, heard, I've heard of many... I don't even know about naming names or whatever, but like many, many prominent Austrians who argue about fractional versus free banking or fractional versus 100% reserve banking, they don't necessarily make the claim that it's fraudulent anymore. And we can talk mm -hmm. about why. If mm -hmm. you want. Yeah, that's why, now I get it, that's why Eric Vasco, remember, I don't know whether that was also mentioned in the panel discussion we once had with you and Eric Vasco, but you know, you've had talks also with Eric Vasco, I'm sure, um, where he, he's not a fan of De Soto. I think the, the reason why is because of the, this, uh, because uh, De Soto is sort of the proponent advocate of uh, full reserve banking. And uh, I mean, the point I think I got out of this is, is that without, uh, uh, with a fully reserved uh, banking, you, you, you cannot, you know, you cannot lend, you cannot produce. So there's no economic activity going. Is that, is that the point maybe Eric Vasco was trying to make with the Soto and the fractional? Or yeah, versus the full I think he's, he, he's, the, he's trying to jump to the, the core idea that really what's happening I say differently than Eric says. What what I say and what I think Fernando says as well is that uh, really what's happening is when you put your money into a bank, you're again you're becoming. So so let's let's bring it back, all back to base money and and to the claim and everything. When you put like a hundred dollars into the bank, uh, you are taking basic money, which is on your balance sheet. So you have a hundred dollars. Let's just say a hundred dollars. Um. It's, it was on your balance sheet, your personal balance sheet is your asset, $100. You deposit it into the bank. Now, the, at that moment, in my view, in Fernando's view, and a lot of people, in Eric's view as well, and a lot of, uh, and this is how it goes legally, like this is upheld in courts and everything else. What happens at that moment is you don't have the $100 anymore. You don't have it. It's, oh, there, there you go. Nice. <laughs> You're now. I'm enlightened. No. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. The light is back on just for that. Listen. Yeah. yeah if, if people are listening. Um, so the, the $100 you have deposited into the bank, at that moment, you don't have $100 in, on your personal balance sheet anymore. You, you don't have the $100 bill. What you now have 
is an as an is is an asset. You've swapped assets, so you don't have the hundred dollar bill, but you have an asset called a claim against the bank. You have a deposit on the bank, and so what the what has happened in that transaction is the bank has gained a hundred dollars, which they can do what they want, and they have also gained a liability of a hundred dollars, which is your deposit. So you are the creditor to the bank; they are the debtor. That is fixed. There is no, like, there can't be any dispute about that. That is, that is legally, economically, accounting wise, what happens is, is that's what happens. Now, a lot of the arguments, I don't want to, I don't even know if I can do them justice, but a lot of the old arguments, I think DeSoto uses some of this as well. What they say is that, you know, you expect to get that hundred dollars back, this and that. So you what really what's happening is there's a dual property certificate sort of thing going on right now is you think you have a property certificate hundred dollars, but then the bank lends out that money and they think that they have, someone else thinks that they have it as well. It's, it's actually not, it's not how it works, um, you know, legally, systemically, economically. And again, this is why most Austrians, most Austrians don't argue that it's fraudulent anymore. If you would read your banking terms, if they don't say explicitly, we're the debtor, you're the creditor, to your funds like you have a you have a claim on the money that you deposited they might use the term specifically debtor creditor if they don't say that they're going to use other legal terms like we have the right to use your funds the way we see fit you can claim this and that like they're going to use all those terms legally so it's there in black and white it's just people don't really want to read the terms of a depository right. agreement of a, of, a, of a checking account agreement so uh that's that's one that's one issue Another issue that's used a lot is um, the idea of this reserve ratio. I don't know if I want to go in there yet because I, I like to try to keep things very simple when I... So the reserve... Let, let's do it quickly. So the reserve <laughs> ratio is one thing that I'm not a fan of because it is a monopolistic, mm -hmm. monopolistic thing. Reserve ratio is what, the, what each central bank sets for their commercial banks. I've said this before. Uh, I need to, I have a lot of thoughts coming when I am upgrading my website and a lot of these money supplies and it will, it will all come out in writing as well. But, um, the reserve ratio is basically a thing that has developed over the last, you know, hundred years, um, where central banks tell each commercial bank in their jurisdiction, in their nation, how much they need in base money, which is that res reserves that they are granted by the central bank and the physical currency, which is a very small proportion, by the way. It's very small, like usually 90 to 95% of physical currency is just floating around in the economy. It's in grocery stores, it's in shoe stores, it's, in, it's under beds. Most currency is not in banks, physical currency. There's only like five to 10% that's actually in bank vaults and probably less than that even. Um, so there's two things that banks have as reserves to this reserve ratio. The first is a little bit of physical cash and mostly this ledger entry or their deposit with the, with the central bank. And the central bank can control that, that amount, how they do that again, buying, selling bonds from those banks, whatever, we don't need to get into that. But, the, but those are the, the reserves that each bank holds. Now, the, the, the claim from, from Austrians is that those reserves need to be 100% to demand deposits, particularly demand deposit they have a rub with. They don't necessarily, if, if there's a time deposit and there's an interest rate, it's clear that it's being lent. They, they sort of concede that point that that doesn't need to be, uh, that, that doesn't need to be reserved 100%, but they really want that the demand deposit is 100%. So now we get back to the point that Eric said. Um, it must be fraudulent if less than 100% of what I put in with that hundred dollar bill is um, is kept in reserve in the bank because I think it's there. I got to give back so on and so forth. This is where now I I would like I'm trying to say that we can break from all sorts of dogma here and just say why can't we just let the market decide what the reserve ratio wants to be? So that doesn't happen in today's system. It's one more bad thing in today's system is the reserve ratio. I said this a lot like. Tell me why the Federal Reserve would know what the reserve ratio of a bank in New York should be versus a bank in Wyoming. Or tell me why the, the European Central Bank should know what the reserve ratio should be for a bank in Latvia versus a bank in Austria. You know, like there's no 
there's no correlation there i mean it's markets are a complete local thing to everyone always you know it's emergent supply and demand people you know people want to borrow money people want to spend money there's no reason why the central bank should know that reserve ratio so even before we get through the door of this fraction reserve banking argument i would say we're in a besides the fact that everybody knows we're in a distorted system because they can print the money at will it's also a distorted system it's a very very important point is that they can set the reserve ratio at will so the reserve ratio typically has been 10% in the US and that's actually for only large institutions for smaller institutions is actually less. A lot of people don't know that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just say, why does it have to be anything? Like why, why can we let each institution decide? And that's, that's what I believe. That's what I believe is that the market would be able to decide the reserve ratio. Uh, but, but you know, we're just not in that system. We're in a very concentrated, monopolized, centralized, banking system where banks set the reserve ratio. So, so you can, hopefully it's, uh, the, the next point that I might make here is, is sort of, it's easy to see where I'm going is that how can we now debate if we're Austrians, right? How can we now debate that a hundred percent, a hundred percent reserve ratio is like the best way to go and the only way to go versus Maybe on the other extreme would be Dr. Selge and Dr. White, who have always always argued at this point, pointed free banking systems in the past that didn't have central banks. Their reserve ratio, and this is a fact, this is a fact, their reserve ratio of banks in Scotland and Canada was less than 1%, sometimes. Sometimes less than 3%, sometimes less than 5 But th- their reserve ratio was very, very small of gold specie, that is like the actual base money, compared to the demand deposits that were outstanding. Um, in the in the economy i just think no one knows i think no one knows that answer um i, th- I might have said this on your show i've said it a couple times I, I think it's interesting this is one person that was on our show bob murphy he's he used to be a free banker now he's a full reserve banker he said this on our show like unprompted by me he said uh you know i don't think the reserve ratio would literally be in a free banking system in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a anarcho-capitalist system I don't think it would be literally 100%, but I think it would be a lot higher than Dr. Selgin thinks. And they, they debated about this a couple of years ago in the Soho Forum, forum maybe a year and a half ago, uh, which is a debate I really encourage your listeners to watch. It's Bob Murphy yeah. versus George Selgin. On it's funny you, you mentioned back. Bob Murphy because it, coincidentally he is right now in Vienna at, at some kind of Austrian economics conference. Oh, interesting. Doing it, it, yeah, it could yeah. be the same uh, that we went to actually. I haven't checked, but it, like, it, was yeah. a, it could be the same type of thing that we did uh, where I met Fernando many, many years ago. That was the Mises Institute. I think it was a donors recognition mm-hmm. conference. But, but in any event, uh, look, I, I, I don't, I don't even like to name names like that because I really like Bob Murphy, and it's not. Um, mm. I'm not trying to win a war on like economic ideas. I just, I, I think at the end of the day, caveat emptor, let the market decide what the reserve ratio should be, and if it's an institution that that merits. Uh, uh, those deposits, meaning it, meaning it performs over the years, it makes. And so what now, now we need to talk about what happens with that money, right? Now we can get back to this hundred dollars gets deposited. Whatever. What is actually happening when you deposit a hundred dollars into the bank? Well, the Austrians would argue that it's not clear that it's being lent out. Okay. Uh, I kind of addressed most of that, I think, but you know, it's in the, it's in the loan agreement caveat emptor, it's a bank, you know that they're engaging in lending activities, like that should be, that should be understand that they're lending all money. It doesn't matter if there's an interest rate paid or not. But, and again, there are legal problems with that because interest rates on demand deposits were stopped for some time in the US. Now they're sort of back, but they're low now, or uh, they're not going negative yet in the US. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it should be clear that the banks lend money. But what is actually happening there? Okay, so again, your $100, you have now, you don't have the hundred dollars. You just don't have it. It's not there. It's not physically on you. It's not in the bank physically either. What you have now is a claim on the bank, but that doesn't mean that the bank has nothing. That doesn't mean that the bank on the other side of that, of that ledger is like, there's nothing there. No, they have assets. The bank now has assets. So the bank takes that hundred dollars. It loans it productively. And Officially, again, the, the ratio is usually 10, uh, 90, 10, right? So 90% loaned out, 10% held in reserve. That, that, again, that, I have a problem with that. I don't think it needs to be that ratio. No one knows what the ratio should be. It should be emergent, it should be the banks, uh, the banking competitive market to determine that. There's no reason why it should be 10%, no reason at all. But the, 
the 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 actual nature of what happened in the hundred dollar bill. It's not like it just disappeared into the economy, or that many other people think that they have that hundred dollars now because it was loaned out. No, it's it's loan lent out to certain parties. There's a there's a new loan agreement now signed with those parties. That party might have a ninety dollar loan, right? That was just uh, engaged with the bank, and then that party goes and spends that money immediately on something else and the money starts working through the economy and that's how you scale a system that's how that's that that's why people start to say like things like credit is the lifeblood of the economy i don't believe that statement either but that's just what's happening in lending that's that's the market of lending is that money goes through the system it's deposited it's lent out this and that now, i do want to say one point again about this uh sort of general scary idea that austrians you can look at any article on mises.org and again i'm a fan of mises.org but if you look at any article about fractional reserve banking you're going to see this idea and the idea is you have a hundred dollars deposit in the bank uh the, the 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 bank takes 90 of that loans it out 90 of that is spent deposited into another bank the bank takes uh Eight, roughly 80 of that loans it out. And so you go on this very, very extreme cycle of lending money that everybody thinks they have $100 in the bank and you have like now a thousand nine hundred dollars that's basically loaned out, lent out. The, because everybody is basically keeping that $100 in reserve, but they've created $900 in, in loans based Roughly, I'm just doing very, very rough numbers there on the on the ten percent reserve. Maybe you're going to get to that point, uh, Matthew. But uh, what if there was a bank run? Just just briefly, what, what would happen if you know? I mean, it could happen. I mean, you know, the IMF and whatever the central banks are talking about in negative interest rates, or you know, uh, abolishing, uh, you know, getting rid of physical cash. And what if people, you know, all of a sudden woke up and say. You know, I mean, we are here in Europe and, you know, we are not isolated. We're not immune to this whole thing, the negative rates. So what would happen to, to you know, to bank in case of a bank run to those deposits? Well, uh, the the question on the uh, the soundness of those deposits has to do with the liquidity of the assets. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, Fernando is a fan of this maturity mismatch school run Rayo is as well. Uh, many others, former DeSoto students as well. Um, as long as you have liquidity on the asset side of your balance sheet that matches the term of the demand, meaning basically on demand zero, you know, zero months, like you can just come in whenever, mm -hmm. then you should be able to handle any run that happens. That's if you strictly view this sort of maturity matching school where you know, you might have, uh, I don't know, one month paper with the government or with the corporation even that pays you a bit of interest, gets you a bit of spread, lets the bank work productively uh, with their with their own capital and with their depositors capital to keep to keep things moving. And then if really if there is an outsized movement in uh, in the run uh, in, in, in their deposits being, being redeemed, right? If there's an outside, if there's a run, as they say, uh, you'll be able to liquidate those securities that are short term to pay that, that would be in a sound banking system. It may be that there's not sound practices with a lot of these banks. They might not be matching their maturities. Well, it may be, but again, like that's not anything I would try to, I would even be interested in talking about like, cause then you go back to this idea about, regulation, uh, reserve ratios, deposit insurance. Like these are just things that the state has come up with because the state doesn't, doesn't allow free banking. If it allowed free banking, then we would have hyper-competitive lending, depositing, people getting interest. You know, why would you even want to run if you had like, I don't know, Apple Pay working really well and uh, Apple was paying you some interest and Apple got into the banking business, consumer credit a little bit. There's all sorts of things that could happen in a free banking system where people can issue claims that circulate as money, right? Those deposits, that, that, that's the whole thing. Deposits, claims, they circulate as money. People can issue that, but it doesn't have to be a central bank. So I don't know uh, like the all-encompassing answer to your question, Kevin, other, other than to say there are uh, examples in history where the the runs 
occur precisely because a bank is managing their assets badly. Runs don't occur on banks that manage their assets well. That that has shown to be true in free banking systems. So, uh, and again, we don't have it. It's it's a it's a it's a theoretical debate. We just don't have it. The te- the, the reserve ratio of ten percent is just it's 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 an insane thing in my mind to even like argue about. Like it's set. The central bank set it. There's no way they know it. There's no way that any Austrian knows that that 10% reserve ratio should be 100%. And there's no way that I know that it should be less than 10%. And I'm not arguing that it should be less than 10%. I'm just saying uh, there has been evidence that banks have worked well with the base money being actually well less than 10% of the demand deposits uh, that are outstanding. Uh, so, but but the last thing I want to say about this, uh, this, uh, uh, Go back to this 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 point about fractional reserve banking and this this typical example that basically you deposit a hundred dollars into the system or a thousand dollars into the system and basically nine x of that is all this is like new bank credit that's all of a sudden out there and it, and it just sort of like you know every hundred dollars we have now nine hundred more dollars of bank credit systemically that's completely wrong it's completely completely wrong it's never happened that way you can look at the numbers it's it. It just, it's, a, it's an incorrect model of looking at the system. And again, I know that I'm now wading into talking about the government-sponsored reserve ratio, because again, I just said I don't like that, but well, we can easily describe how that's a wrong way. So uh, a, bank, a bank receives $100 in, in a new deposit, right? And so then they lend out uh, uh, 90. Um, that's, that's, so now they have... Uh, there's ninety ninety dollars that's that's out there. Now, the uh, what happens in the as it goes through the steps is that 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 base money is always the sort of the trigger of how much can be lent out. So if I go out and I take a hundred, if if someone goes and takes a loan right of of ninety in the next in the next. Uh, scale the next step of lending okay anybody that takes that 90 dollars out of the bank to you know pay for um i don't know pay for uh something else they've immediately removed the lending power of that bank and and so it was with the bank that gave me the hundred dollars so who paid me the hundred dollars presumably i took it from a bank I, whether I got it from a, my paycheck or whatever, or I got it from a loan. If I took the hundred dollars from a bank, that this is the, this is the, this is the, this is the spot that's always ignored is I have immediately removed a hundred dollars of lending power from the other bank, actually $900 because they can, they can reserve it, uh, you know, nine to one basically. So, uh, no one talks about the step before me. So I have a hundred dollars that I took from some bank. I put it in another bank, but systemically nothing actually happened so i took a hundred dollars from from one bank that bank systemically lost nine hundred dollars of lending power they lost i think i said a hundred dollars lending power before nine hundred dollars of lending power a hundred dollars of base money that bank lost it from their assets another bank gained it so that's that's actually what's happened is systemically you're just people remove money from banks they put money in banks the only institution under our current system that can increase this proportion of base money to total outstanding deposits is in fact the central bank by two ways Mm -hmm. the central bank can either increase the base money in the total supply or they can change the reserve ratio but this general idea which you see all the time on on mises.org or whatnot is that this this pyramid of of a hundred dollars to nine hundred dollars in credit happens with every hundred dollar bill that's floating around the economy and it's just not true because no one talks about the step before and the step before i deposited my hundred dollars in the bank is i took it from another bank either someone lent it to me i was paid and then i took it out so that's a very very key component is that systemically the the chain of the steps there it's just very important to look at at, at not just one bank and one bank's lending power to the next bank this and that but to understand that every time hundred dollars is taken out of one bank they are th- then you are removing 
that fractional reserve lending power, whatever, from from uh, from the from that bank. So systemically, we're even. Systemically, we're even. And this this you will see. Like you don't see. Uh, you would just assume by this sort of this general these g- general uh, articles about how hundred dollars gets lent into nine hundred dollars every time. You would assume that we just have like a quadrillion dollars in demand deposits in the economy. It's just not the case. Uh, it's not the case. We have. Um, it is true that overall, uh, like say M three, like the most broadest money supply. This we're talking about these claims earlier. This is like time deposits, large corporations, time deposits. Where does Warren Buffett put his money? It's usually in time deposits after he takes out the stock market. There's like very, very all of these big, big, massive claims. Um, it is true that those have generally grown you know, in the last 50 years as a proportion of base money, but demand deposits actually have stayed the same or gone down. Meaning, meaning, uh, if you had say, I'm just using, um, I have this somewhere, but I I don't know if I can pull it up right now, but let's just say, say an example. Let's say the stock of base money increased, uh, 30 times in the last 50 years in the U S then the stock of M1, that is demand deposits, uh, minus, minus, you need to remove the physical cash because physical cash is also in M1. But if you just look at demand deposit component of M1, that has increased actually less than 30 times. And I don't say that's good or bad. I'm just saying mm-hmm. it's, it's not the example of what you would assume. You would assume under the uh, you know, typical $100 into a bank, it's lent to 900, then the next 100 goes in. And we're just like in this, this sea of money. It's just not how it works because systemically, every time one person removes $100, you know, which starts that chain, that bank lost nine hundred dollars in lending power. So there's always this push pull between between the banks, and you just the numbers don't lie there. That that uh, there is no like massive pyramiding of demand deposits and then other deposits on top of this base money in 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 banks. There's just uh, there's just this general reserve ratio that that goes from bank to bank usually stays around ten percent, um, and I'm, I'm speaking about the U.S. specifically here. That's the money supply that I know the most as far as these demand deposits relationships go. It usually stays around ten percent. So systemically, I know I'm sort of jumping around here, but I, I hope that that point is clear. Systemically, it hasn't changed, meaning uh, the monetary base. Say it increased. Uh, I'll just give con- concrete listener numbers to your listeners here. Um, Would you say those numbers that you that you also you know elaborated and worked it out is yeah. that like verifiable or uh, do you think other numbers that are obfuscated or oh yeah that, he disclosed you know like yeah, that's a, that's really whatever offshore I don't know <laughs> you know sure, sure. no no I mean that's a good point like there are many things in the banking system that are opaque. Mm-hmm. What I, I'm using numbers that the the, regu- the main regulator right. is the Federal Reserve. There's, it's not a blockchain. There's no understanding that those claims are completely accurate. Uh, absolutely. But, you know, economists, whether they want to argue their points one way or the other, will always use these numbers. But no one looks at the, the overall totals. So just to give your listeners, and I'll have more written up about this over time, but it's going to take some time. Um, so the... So here we go. The, the size of base money in banks, right, which is the sm- small physical portion of cash in bank vaults and reserves, which is completely decided by the Federal Reserve in, or, or the central bank. The size of base money in banks in the last 50 years has gone up about 100x. That's actually, it was actually close to 200x right around 2014 when there's like massive quantitative easing that's come down. But, you know, in 1970, it was 1x. Here in 2019, uh, August, I think is my last data here, it's 97x. So that means <laughs> it's crazy. It is, it is a crazy number. It's a crazy number. But again, if, if, uh, if as long as demand for that money is met, prices won't rise. But as we notice, price, prices rise. So demand is never enough to counter for the increase in supply. So again, I, I don't want to like, maybe there's some good reason at some point to do it, but, but I'm not, I would never defend the regulator in that way. I'm just saying it's been up 97 X. Okay. Now here's the interesting thing. M one deposits, M one deposits are only up 13 X. They're only up 13 X. 
So what that means is for every dollar in the monetary base in a bank, which is their lending power, that's their lending power that they can, they can lend nine times to every one that they have in the bank. It's actually gone down the ratio of 97 divided by 13. You're at basically for every dollar. And this is, uh, I'm going to tell you before the financial crisis and then after. So before the financial crisis, which was September, uh, you know, September, 2008, August, 2008, uh, it was about 67, 68 cents. So every dollar in base money that was added to banks by the Federal Reserve, M1 deposits only increased 67 cents, right? That, that's up until the financial crisis. But then if you divide that number that I just told you, 97 by 13, you'll, you, you get a much lower number because reserves just exploded. Everything since 2008, like all the numbers have just gone wacky with what they've done. Now, M1 has only increased 14 cents. But either way, post-crisis or now, uh, M1, and that, when I say M1, I think demand deposits, the demand deposit component of M1, not, not the physical currency component, just M1 demand deposits. It's increased at a slower amount than the monetary base. That's completely counter to any, any sort of... Uh, Rational. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, it's, it's counter to what you hear about uh, the dangers of fractional reserve banking or that you put $100 in the bank and it just inflates the heck out of the money supply, what people think they have in the money supply, so on and so forth. Uh, those numbers are just much, much uh, more tame than most people might expect. Now, I'm not saying that there is not credit that has been made in that time, which was... Uh, malinvested or basically just misappropriated uh, there absolutely has been that's that's a core component of austrian theory and i absolutely agree with that i'm i'm not a fan of the central bank money monopoly in in society but you need to parse through i think a couple of these things just by looking at the facts and the facts are um that the demand deposits contrary to what you might have read uh, actually decrease at a slower rate than base money in banks, their lending power. And that has, uh, that was true before the financial crisis and now, and now it's even less so, you know, 97 divided by 13, whatever I showed you there. Um, you know, so for every dollar of base money in, in banks, uh, the demand deposits have only increased 14 cents right now since in the last 50 years. Of course, again, that's things have really gotten out of proportion. But if you look before the financial crisis, they only increased by 67, uh, 67 cents. Mm -hmm. So it just shows that banks aren't really like uh, making these deposits in a crazy way that you would think. Uh, but again, I, 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 every time you say these stats, people think like, oh, well, then you must be in favor of the way that the central bank regulates. And that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying this is one way to scale a system. This is how it's been done. It's not done the way that you necessarily think you have to actually have to look at the data there. Um, and, and, you know, and that's it. Like I, I would much rather have a free banking system where you didn't have any of these reserve ratios. You didn't have any uh, monopoly provider of the base money stock. Then it would be a really uh, competitive system. We don't have that. So that is why we uh, focus on Bitcoin. <laughs> Right, right. So yeah, now that you mentioned Bitcoin, can we tie this in into Bitcoin? First of all, let me ask you first, you know, there's this official number of global debt, which is approximately 250 trillion US dollars. Or, and then if you add the unfunded liabilities and whatever derivatives, you get like a, you know, a crazy insane number of 1.8 quadrillion. What is it? What's the implication? I mean, what does it mean for Bitcoin and, and what would change if it would, you know, got reduced and increased, you know, the monetary base? Like, is there a bigger comprehension, you know, for the average person to understand? What does it mean for, you know, for the average person out there in the future? Yeah, so global debt has, uh, that's the one uh, metric that sort of does stay relatively consistent with the monetary base. Mm hmm um, so as I told you, demand deposits have actually gone down relative to the monetary, monetary base increase. Global debt is more or less the same. I, I, actually, I say government debt. I'm, I'm going to 
chop out a lot of the other things, like you said, corporate debt, derivatives, uh, everything else. But if you looked at the real money multiplier of government debt, it's usually one to one. So it, uh, again, last 50 years, uh, you started both at one to one, whatever they were, right? They were one to one each, each number. Uh, before 2008, government debt was actually $2 to every dollar increase in the monetary base. So we we're able to increase global debt a little bit faster. And that fell in the 2000 that post crisis. And now that ratio is about 1.15 and it fell to like 0.8 a couple of years ago. So what that means is, is basically it, it's pretty close to one to one. So whatever the monetary base does, global debt can do. And that makes sense because monetary base, pretty much most of it funds government bonds. It funds the shortfall that the government can't sell into the market the federal reserve has to buy that with printed money so um there's no implication there's no uh there's no indication that that might change uh as long as they can hold on to the monopoly printing power and they can uh they can print money to cover shortfalls in their respective governments i think they're going to do that um if the market you know a lot of people like to say they there's couple years ago and even now you know they used to call them the bond vigilantes you know the people that thought that the bond prices were just way too high and they were going to short the heck out of them and make the government lose control they haven't been able to do that yet these bond vigilantes that the free market capitalists are hoping for i i would like them too i mean like again i don't have any vested interest in government debt i would like it to sort of be more rational and whatnot um the tough thing about all these numbers is is that Again, we're, I'm, I'm describing them in a system of a, that's monopolized. You know, it's a system of a, one central issuer. You just don't know what it would be like in a system where we had competitive money that could restrain uh, governments, where they couldn't, you know, just tax and spend and print. They could only just tax and spend. And, um, you know, that, that's, it's, it's hard to know. I gave another chart in my recent uh, release on the monetary base, which I think is a really interesting one. It's uh, if you look at the global monetary base, which right now in dollar terms about 19 trillion, it's fallen because a lot of currencies has fallen against the dollar. It was like 21 trillion two years ago. Um, it's not that they're printing less money. It's just that the there's one sort of exchange rate you can look at, and that's the dollar. Mm-hmm. So you know the euro, uh, the yen, the yuan, they've all fallen against the dollar a little bit in recent years. So the the global number has fallen. So but anyway, about 19 trillion. And if you look at all the gold in those banks, this, again, this is a top 30 floating currencies in the world. It's like 95% of global GDP. The, if you look at all the gold that sits in those banks, if you're a believer in gold as being like real money, like sound money, they still hold uh, gold, but that's only about 7% of that number. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's a trillion something, whatever. So it's 19 trillion. I think it's 7% of the exact. Let's do it quick. Yeah, it's like 1.3 trillion in gold in dollar terms, right? So what does that, that indicate? That indicates that of about 17 and a half or more of the monetary base in US dollar terms is seniorage. That's, that's one definition of seniorage if you believe that gold is market money. And they've, they've been able to print, you know, over, that's an outstanding number. It's not like every year or whatever. It's outstanding. So you know, every year they've been able to uh, keep, and generally that number increases, right? So they've been able to increase this seniorage globally that amounts something in the range of 17 and a half trillion in base money um, that clears the value of the gold that those monopoly issuers hold. So that is, that is seniors. That literally is printing money above the cost that it does for you to, either the cost for you to do it or the cost of market money in, in this way, gold. So it's a big number. Do I, do I think that it will stop there or will, it, will there be you know, any big market change? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, I think one important thing to know with these central banks is that they're not all in unison, particularly China. You know, it may be that the ECB, the, uh, the, the BOJ, the Bank of Japan, and the Fed coordinate and like talk a lot, but you have this huge outlier that's China. Um, I don't think China does a lot of good things with their social, you know, policies, but at least as a competitor on the monetary scale, they are there and they have entered the arena. And this is why you have all this stuff about digital currencies, centrally backed Mm -hmm. digital currencies, uh, CBDCs, all all these sorts of things. 
um, central bank digital currencies, like everybody's trying to see where this new monetary order will, uh, will sort of uh, fall and shake out. And China is absolutely going to be a part of that. So, you know, years ago, it was talking about adding the UN to the SDR basket. Mm-hmm. Now it's talking about maybe we need a digital currency with the UN in it. Um, the Libra is getting in there to sort of mess it up. What's the Libra basket going to be? Uh, yeah, these are definitely big things. And um, I'm not, I, you know, I try, like Eric, I try to not make too many predictions uh, primarily because a lot of hard money people have been disappointed in the past. You know, mm-hmm. we've seen the power that the state can hold when it comes not only to money, but to, to everything like enforcing their will, enforcing laws, you know, defense, all these things. Like there's a lot of things that go into money. Measuring the money stock is, I think, is very interesting. Measuring the, as I told you, some of these real money multipliers, like if something increases, if the monetary base increases, how much does something else increase? That's a very interesting thing. But at the end of the day, like, you know, I've said, I say this all the time. If you, you know, if you were a, a gold bug in 1980, you would have been disappointed for the next 20 years. Right. That's a bear market. And they actually, that's a pretty bottom. long bear market we've had, huh? I mean, gold, this is yeah. like 20 years or what? I mean, 20 years, 1980 to 2000. Yeah. By the way, is it true? I mean, I heard it. I know Max Kaiser, some kind of expert that reports allegedly, I don't know. I mean, we don't go into speculation that China allegedly has much more gold, something like in the range of, 20 21,000 tons of gold if that is i mean if that is true then wow i mean this is i haven't heard i mean i have uh the official gold holdings let me um, yeah mm-hmm. let me check really and quick. of course they've been accumulating not only china but you know russia sent ever you know all central banks have been accumulating like crazy yeah they have but again i, I uh that, that 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 stat i just said is is, mm-hmm. is indicative there because it still shows primarily the power of the western central banks because that stat in 1980 was 80%. Of course, that was when gold was at its all-time high in U.S. dollar terms. But the gold that sat in central banks in 1980 was 80% of the monetary base that was printed. So it was massive. Now it's only 7%. So it shows that they've all been able to print more. And by the way, China wants to do this too. It's not like they could say they're buying gold. Russia would love to do this. Russia would love to print. You know, they say that they're buying gold. They, they are buying gold. Absolutely. A lot of these emerging central banks are. But still the blended overall proportion is as low as it's ever been, you know, Mm -hmm. 7% of the monetary base. So it just shows they can print money well above the value of their gold reserves. And um, I think they're just going to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. Let me, I'm curious what you just said about Max Kaiser. Let me look at the numbers that I have. These are official gold reserves. Um, The, I like to put them into, uh, I like to put them into uh, ounces too. So I, I, just because I like, you know, I think that that's a nice, you know, market. Because one thing is sure. I mean, that, that is admitted that there is part of the gold hoardings or whatever accumulation uh, that is not disclosed by a lot of central banks or governments. I'm sure that that's true too. I'm sure that that's true. Again, like none of this stuff is a blockchain. Never going to know for sure. Uh, the number that I have is so he said twenty. That's what I what I have. Thousand tons. Yeah, something like that. It's Twenty-one thousand tons. You remember that number? Yeah, that's, that's huge. Because I'm looking at only a thousand here, roughly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. But... Actually, close to two thousand. Close to two thousand. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm, two thousand mm-hmm. tons. So you're talking ten x of the official number. Maybe, maybe. Again, that goes back to uh, that goes back to uh, you know the, all this this uh, emerging competitive sort of threat level stuff that every every mm-hmm. central bank is going going against everyone else. Like I, I think it's the jury is is just still out on so much of this because you know Bitcoin I think will play a role, uh, but I, it's it's just going to be a long time before like Bitcoin if Bitcoin really supersedes all of them and i believe that it has a very good chance of doing that but- don't you think it could happen much faster because i mean you know as also safed and Amuz and many other you know people said bitcoin is that once you know a central bank or you know it could be a small country or like venezuela iran or you know starting uh you know uh, 
um, what do you call it, a put a hoarding uh, Bitcoin as a, as a partial reserve uh, asset. Yeah, so, so I, I would just look at the numbers there and, I, and I'll definitely track it. Like we'll be able to tell if it's really cutting into mm -hmm. the seniorage. Right now it's a rounding error. So, uh, and even the current, even the countries that it won't be a rounding error for, those countries themselves are a rounding error of the global monetary base. So that's a, that's an important thing, you know, like not, I got 30, I, I'm, we'll, we'll have 40 probably by next year, but like I got 30, the top floating, you need to look at floating, not fixed, but the top floating, uh, 30 fiat currencies in the world, 18 trillion, the U S dollar, the Euro, the yen and the UN, and then the great British pound, formerly great British pound, let's like say, and the Indian rupee, they make up 90% of that pie. So top six make up 90% of the top 30. And that like Venezuela is a rounding error there. Like there's no point of putting Venezuela into there because it's so, so small, especially when you look at it in dollar terms, uh, regardless of how much inflation they do to like add that inflation rate to the blended rate that we report. But it's so, so small. And then, yeah, Bitcoin will be, that, like there's no doubt that Bitcoin, it's already making an effect to the people there. It's mm -hmm. great. It's absolutely great. Like this is, this is the beauty of the free market. It's being served by market money. All of those things. I completely agree with what everybody says about the beauty of Bitcoin there. But as a size of the seniorage that's able to be done today, it's just so small. You know, like I said, 17 and a half trillion, 18 trillion is basically seniorage. That's money that's printed above central bank gold holding, official gold holding. Um, it's massive. They've, they're able to do it. They're able to do it. They're able to, you know, enforce their will, pass their laws, uh, strong arm, whatever people need to do to believe in those currencies. And this is like not a new thing. You know, I mean, FDIC insurance started right after the Great Depression, while the Great Depression was on, uh, you know, the ending of the, the main gold standard for the U.S. Uh, all of those things, that was, you know, 80 years ago, 90 years, 80 years ago. And um, the, you know, the this this monetary experiment that we're on now with like pure fiat like i said pure fiat basic money backing other claims is uh only 50 years old so i really i really have no i have there's nothing that tells me that it will be fast and actually yeah. i don't want to give financial advice or whatnot but i i do try to prepare myself generally for that like i think it's great like people should if you're a main believer in Bitcoin, like expose all you want, it's not financial advice, but um, there's nothing in my mind that shows that it will be fast. I, I hope that I'm wrong in a, in, a, in a good way because I'm not a fan of like doom and gloom, boom, bust, like uh, a massive cleanse of the system with good money to drive out bad. I, 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 you know, you don't want people to be run out. That's how like- No, but realistic. I mean, you know, when you listen to these experts uh, such as Austrian economists like Thorsten Pollard, Markus Kral, I mean, these are like super, you know, knowledgeable people who are really even predicted the, the, uh, the mass firings within the German, uh, uh, you know, Deutsche Bank uh, yeah. months before it happened. So they're already, they're saying it could happen. The recession could come even earlier than, than end of 2020. And it could start in Germany, you know, the, like literally banks crashing. I, I, I think it's realistic. And with all the other compounding factors with whatever negative interest rate policies and, yeah. and insolvency. If you add up, if you add up the negative columns, it certainly seems like there's a lot more things uh, that could go wrong than go right. If you add up the negative columns compared to the positive columns of the, generally the economy, but particularly how the money system works. Um, I agree. I mean, that's why we track this stuff. And I agree, like since 2008, all of the sort of the general figures of what normally worked for a central bank aren't working like massive amounts of reserves minimal amount of lending nobody's sure if they really price inflation will follow if lending does get done uh interest being paid on bank reserves uh that's a, that's another huge thing like you know banks used to have to competitively lend out their reserves that's how banking was you know was working and, and you would see which banks needed more reserves than others. Maybe those banks should be lent at for a discount or a higher interest rate, so on and so forth. And, and now central banks in Europe and the US and 
Japan. They are, they're basically, um, they're paying interest on the reserves to banks precisely because they're worried about banks lending too much of their created money out into the economy. But they want them to have that created money to cover these like sort of reserve ratios and these other things. So it's just this, all this weird, like paradoxical, uh, strange things. And so, yeah, banks are now not buying like treasuries. They're not buying, you know, those shorter term maturities that I was talking about before. They're not matching liquidity at all. They're just looking at, oh, let's just park our money with the Federal Reserve, receive interest on our reserves. The Fed is now sort of just becoming this weird borrower. Uh, another nice quote that George Selden used to say, they used to be the lender of last resort. Now central banks are the borrower of first resort, meaning they hate, they are just, uh, they're just, it, it's like the reserves now have become some weird uh, loan that they're, uh, they're, they're taking from banks. They're paying those reserves with interest. And so banks are like, well, we might as well just hold that. Let's not buy treasuries. And you saw that spike in, uh, there was a, a spike in the federal funds rate uh, a month ago, a month and a half ago, um, precisely because of this, because banks weren't buying uh, other short term treasuries. And, and so the Fed had to step in and buy. Uh, they had to sort of fill the gap. And that was where they, they're not calling it quantitative easing, but it basically is quantitative easing where they're filling the gap of these government bonds that banks aren't uh, purchasing themselves themselves so that's again that's the same story that's been happening for the last 10 years uh it's a lot of intervention it's a lot of distortion i'm totally with all of the austrian views there um absolutely i think that like we have the correct lens of the economy and and everything else but i just i do caution uh people when you're talking about anything it's gold silver bitcoin um you know caveat emptor you know, the, the market is relentless in, in how things go. And unfortunately, we just don't have a free market in money. You know, we have a massive, right. massive uh, this X factor, which is the monopoly issuer of money that is the central bank in each country. And they can, you know, they will not let go of that power easily. Yeah. But if, if the shit happens, I mean, if it really hits the fan and it goes by, you know, order of magnitude, uh, you you mentioned like the ultimate settlement something in, in the beginning. You think Bitcoin could be like the ultimate settlement, like the super transition key to a new paradigm shift into you know new. So we don't have you know exactly all these scenarios. You know chaos, panic, and pain, and suffering. I mean, I I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I uh, I hope that it will happen in a peaceful way. If it does. But again, history has shown when monetary systems have broken down, you know, that's like the rise of wars. That's the rise of populism, dictators, people that think that they can give a glimmer of hope to people that have lost their savings, lost their jobs through, again, precisely the bad monetary policy that, you know, the state brought about. It's a bad track record from history. So I just, I don't want to see it happen that way. I would love for Bitcoin to be a peaceful and I, I'm not insinuating that you're, you want that to happen, but I, like, no, no. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. You know, that could be the transition, the yeah. only uh, viable transition, maybe not smooth as, as, as imagined, but yeah. yeah, it would be great. I mean, to have a peaceful, um, sound, you know, mm -hmm. competitive monetary base, base type of money that, that starts to make its way into banks. Um, it would be really interesting to see. I don't, yeah. I, I have to be honest there. Like that's, that's just really, I think it's hard to predict. I think the state will stand ready to bail out, to back up, to backstop bad further malinvestments of banks, uh, all of those things. Uh, so I don't want to make any predictions there, but I will tell your listeners, like we're, we're tracking a lot of that. We're going to try to um, expand that on our website to make it really easy to track a lot of these different money supplies. Because I think, I think one, one thing I've learned doing this monetary base uh, uh, presentation is that a lot of these currencies like act a lot differently than, than the others. Uh, but it is true that, you know, the top six are 90% of the pie of the top 30. So we have to watch those probably the most, um, you know, I, I just tweeted a, a couple of days ago, you know, how India 
mm-hmm. uh, cut, cut their uh, the old 500,000 rupee note. I think they added a new thousand rupee note since then. Some more secure note or whatever, probably RFID or something. But um, they cut that uh, money stock like 25%, 26%, exactly three years ago. Mm-hmm. Now it's 26% higher than it was just before the drop, like 70% higher than it was after the drop. And if you just look at it as a chart, it's almost like you have this one destabilizing thing from the Bank of India in the name of corruption or whatever, but really trying to test if they can get cash out of the economy is impossible. They put cash back into the economy and that looks just the same. So uh, that tells me that this digitizing of cash is going to be very difficult. Um, you just look around how hard it is for people to get into Bitcoin. I think it's going to be maybe slightly less hard to get into a centrally a central bank digital currency, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's very uh, money is just a long-term generational thing. You know, I think it's going to take, I think it's going to take some time and I'm not optimistic that they're going to cut cash because I see cash growing every year. Really? Okay. Yeah. Even the cash component of the, of those currencies generally grows. It doesn't grow as crazy as the reserve component, uh, but it grows and I just, I, I don't, I don't see any like major, major mm-hmm. thing. But again, I, I hope I'm wrong for the, for the good and the, and the peaceful way, as you said, that Bitcoin can continue to eat into a lot of this, uh, this distortion, you know, that central banks cause. So. Mm-hmm. The analysis you've been doing, is there like, or are you planning to do like an analysis? What's like the short term, midterm effect on the price of Bitcoin or the adoption rate or any kind of fluctuation, any kind of movement is, or is it just esoteric yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, no, no. As uh, I like, I like to just track more than I like to make predictive models. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of predictive models on price uh, with Bitcoin or, um, you know, the, the stock to flow is one, but there's also like trying to gauge demand, trying to gauge, uh, uh, trends in the in the like the power curve that Bitcoin makes or the uh, logarithmic curve, um, these log log charts. There's all sorts of like predictive models that people are trying to do with price. Uh, I think that's a function of trading. Trading is interesting. Might might work for some people in the long term. Uh, that's just it's just not as interesting to me to predict price. But I really like comparing price. You know with other things, just like I like comparing, you know, demand deposits to the monetary base to actually just, just view what has factually happened. And then maybe if we can draw some conclusions there, you know, great. But, um, so, so definitely we're going to keep improving that. I think we have a good start here. Uh, but I, I, I do have a lot of, um, uh, you know, cause Fernando and I as well, like we're, we're kind of, I think like you, you know, we're into the Austrian economic side, but also maybe just the general econ side. Like there's so much amazing things going on in Bitcoin with Lightning Network and uh, just more uh, faster, better ways for noobs to get in. Mm -hmm. That's that's really growing a lot. Yeah. It's great. Uh, It's just not really necessarily what we're uh, we're focused on. So Mm -hmm. I think we're going to continue to um, we're going to continue to just try to Look at it as a proportion, as a scale uh, compared to the rest of the economy, and then and then we'll see. And this is another thing too, like you know, Nassim Taleb writes about this. Jim Rickards, who's not a fan of Bitcoin, uh, writes about this. Like, definitely, I think if you look at monetary history, you will see this: is that uh, and and general market history is that markets tend to move in power curves; they don't move in linear curves. That's why all those uh, predictive models about mortgage-backed securities in 2007 2008 failed because yeah, you're predicting okay standard inflation rate rent levels increasing expenses increasing a little bit more or less uh very linear models going into the future uh and then things you know will just be hunky dory in reality you have these massive black swan events where it it's a it's sort of like a hundred year flood you know it just takes people by surprise the shock uh the economy has to adjust you know, that, that's, that's generally what tends to happen. So I wouldn't be surprised if something like that happened, but it would be very interesting to, obviously I think Bitcoin will succeed 
in the midterm, even if it doesn't like, you know, gold fell a lot in 2009 during the crisis, just like everything else, but then gold rose. So like, I do think that there probably will be some surprises, but I do think if we look at the long term sort of trends and the comparisons of how Bitcoin does uh, compared to these other things, we might, we might gain some insights, but you know, right now, you know, to sort of, to be honest or to tell everybody like either that's an opportunity or, uh, you know, it's just going to take a long time. Bitcoin really is a rounding error. Like the, the size of Bitcoin is a, is a rounding error to, uh, the main monetary bases of the world, the main currencies and the total monetary base of the world. So it's, I think it's, it could take a lot longer than, than people suspect. This has been a fascinating, one of the most important, I think, educational pieces we've done because um, it's all about education. So uh, is there anything else, um, Matthew, that you think people should dive into? I'm going to you know, put your uh, Crypto Voices, your podcast, uh, this, this excellent Twitter thread. So I really urge people, my listeners, to, to listen and to really read and understand you know, the, the essence and the bigger picture of what is, what is monetary base, what's the implications. Um, is there anything else you want to like add? No, I think we covered it. Uh, thanks a lot for your time, Kevin. I just, yeah, we're at uh, cryptovoices.com. Uh, the podcast is there and uh, all the exhibits. We have some Bitcoin exhibits as well. Uh, cryptovoices.com slash base money is the, the monetary base exhibit, which probably Fernando and I have been more, uh, more, more rigorous on, I guess I could say, than most in terms of just really trying to look at what it is. Um, versus the rest of things that act like money in society. Um, so hopefully, you know, we can, we can continue to work on that and it helps people and, uh, you know, always happy to, to share the thoughts. So thanks a lot for, for your time. Well, thank you, Matthew. And hope to see you soon, maybe in, maybe hopefully sometime soon in Vienna, because uh, there's a satellite uh, event coming on uh, uh, with, uh, organized by Daniel Wingen, you know, the Value Bitcoin Conference. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, so there's a little bit more, hopefully, activity in Austria because it's a little bit passive, I think, in, compared to other countries, but that's my perception. Well, so, a lovely place. Lovely yeah, place. Yeah. Place. yeah. So, no. yeah, so really happy to, you know, have had this talk and, and learned a lot my, with my listeners. So, yeah, talk to you soon. Great. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Nice to Thank you. With you. Bye-bye, Bye. Matthew. Ciao. Welcome to the podcast show by Kay Van Davani, The Total Connector. Total Bitcoin, Austrian economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin.